Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sadia Zahidi. I head the forum's work on education, gender, and work um, at, the, at the World Economic Forum. Welcome. Uh, we're very excited to be kicking off the issue briefing on the impact of women uh, impact uh, on women of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, a quick uh, point of housekeeping, when the minister is speaking, he will be speaking in Japanese, and if you'd like to uh, hear the translation, switch to channel one. You should all have, um, have those headsets. Okay, great, we will get started. Let me introduce our two um, panelists. Uh, dean Mary Boyce is the Dean of Engineering at the Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science at Columbia University in the United States. Um, and Shimamura-san uh, is the Executive Acting Secretary General of the Liberal Democratic Party, member of the House of Representatives of Japan, um, and a former minister. Welcome. Let me give just a little bit of context uh, based on some of the work that we've been doing at the World Economic Forum. Last year at this time, we released a study on the future of jobs, and it looked in part at what the impact uh, of the fourth industrial revolution would be on women. And we found that out of the jobs that tend to employ mainly men, for every um, new job that would be created, three would be lost. And for the types of jobs that tend to employ more women, for every new job that would be created, five would be lost. And so at least in the white collar professional workforce and the type of disruption that it would be facing, uh, it is possible that there will be a more negative impact on women. Now, of course, there are many other sectors, many other types of professions, and it could be that we find that this is actually an opportunity to accelerate gender equality rather than to lose ground. And that's what we're going to try to find out here today. So let me start with Dean Boyce. Um, what do you think will be the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on women? What will it look like in terms of the distribution of work between women and men? How does it look in different geographies and in different industries? Um, well, first, thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, and I have a very positive outlook, and I think it will, um, there's a great opportunity for the, what's being referred to as the fourth industrial revolution to actually accelerate uh, gender equality in, in the workforce. Um, when we look at the um, fact that we have a great convergence on so many fields, that technology is really disrupting so much, and whether it's uh, biology, medicine, sustainability. Uh, this is a great message to young men and women everywhere that the impact, I look at it as the impact of engineering and applied science on all aspects of humanity. This is a very motivational message. And I think this will draw in women in a great way uh, to these, these new job opportunities that are gonna be emerging over the coming decades. So our ability to bring uh, technological disruptions uh, to medicine, okay, to sustainability, uh, to, to our connectivity with one another, and to our creativity. Uh, this is a different message and a different um, if you will, stereotype of what an engineer or applied scientist has been in the past. And I think we have an opportunity to shift the stereotype, to attract women, to attract a very diverse population, to, uh, to enter engineering and to enter this new opportunity. So I, f I feel uh, very positive about the future uh, impact on women. Of course, we have to help get them there. Okay, so we're going to talk in a, in a second about how we do that. Uh, Shimomura-san, let me ask you, what do you think the impact of the Fourth Industrial Revolution will be on women in Japan? Uh, on the other side of the world, what will happen in particular in terms of the fact that there is a smaller shrinking workforce, more women are being brought into the economy, are there likely to be positive or negative impacts from the 4IR? Right. We have a changes in phases. First of all, at the current situation, 
we call it MG curve, but especially the ladies in the 30s, it's been employed 75%. That's, that's very small. The reason, why is it? Because they're very occupied with uh, looking after children or nursing their parents. Women are forced almost, in a way, to engage in those activities. So the current ABEB administration is helping, assisting those situations to the women can go back to the workforce without having a children waiting for daycare or leaving the nursing care. So in that way, well, the fourth industrial revolution is beginning already, and the next 15 years, well, the British uh, scientist Michael Osborne have mentioned that in America, 47% of the jobs would be changing because of the computer. And according to a think tank survey in Japan, 49% um, the job will be uh, handed over to the computer. So unless there's a new uh, industry, half the population will be jobless. In Japan, We had a survey, how do we adapt to the society? The Jap uh, in Japan, women responded more positively. Well, in the past, the uh, computer will take over people's job. They, it has been done in three areas in the past. It's not only in Japan, I think it's universal. The first area is that hospitality. To give um, kindness to the people. And hospitality is an area where women are excelled more. And the second area is I think it's, it's nothing to do with the sexuality or gender, it's creativity. To create something from nothing, that is creativity, that is being also wanted. And the third thing is, it's governability. So we have lots of different opinions, and how do we actually manage it and govern and put it into one directive? And it's needed in, in business, and needed in society, needed in, in global, global society. So I think these areas are something that is needed when we are seeing more development in AI. And I think that's considered to be the area that is more excelled amongst women. And I think that is reflected in the service results, that women are more adaptable to the new environment. So, put another way, you're saying that there are certain areas um, which require more human traits, and women have tended to excel more in those in the past, perhaps something like the care sector. So there's an increase or a growth in, in roles and jobs in that. There's an increase in the type of roles that um, require creativity, and, and those will continue to grow. There's an increase um, in the need for more leadership to govern this transformation and change that we're in the midst of. And then, of course, there's actually a need for um, some of the more talent in the space that is driving the fourth industrial revolution, and that is uh, STEM-related roles, ICT and STEM-related roles, um, so science, technology, engineering, and math. So let's hear a little bit more from you, Dean Boyce, on that aspect. Do we need to get more women into that pipeline and how? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that that's a critical aspect of, uh, of, of the participation of men and women in this fourth industrial revolution and really being preparing themselves for the fact that um, we're going to have major disruptions in the, the type of jobs available in the future, but we're going to have new jobs emerging that we never <coughs> would have imagined before. And these are far more knowledge-based than ever 
you know, in, in, in any uh, recent history. So if we think of the fact that um, we've always considered liberal arts as a foundational education, the, and there's been a straying away from math and science and engineering. I think as we look to the future, uh, math, science, engineering are foundational uh, as an education. Uh, we are certainly seeing this in universities. Uh, at Columbia Engineering, we are actually rather proud of our, our history with women, that we have over 40% women in our engineering undergraduate program, 47% women in, in our entering uh, undergraduate program. In the graduate program, at the, in the master's, we're at over 30%, and at the PhD, on the order of 25%. So we are definitely working on how do we, um, as one university, um, attract women t to this incredible opportunity, and, and we feel we're succeeding. And I'd, I'd like to say, I think the presence of women also attracts other women, right? So that's a tipping point, as we like to use the word tipping point, um, that uh, women uh, and the visibility of women in these fields, and it's not just in the caring elements of these fields, it's in all parts of these fields. Women actually architect new computers. <laughs> Okay, women are changing the face of medical technologies. Women are at the heart of creativity. So women are in all parts of these fields and can really play a major role. And we need their visibility because that attracts and welcomes <laughs> other women into the field. So I've talked a bit about um, at the college level, but this really now needs to start and permeate um, into our um, uh, elementary school or high schools that the sense that um, every student should get empowered with mathematics, with science, with engineering, um, and that they should feel uh, that that's part of what they should be learning just as much as reading and writing. And uh, I, I, we need to change that dynamic. And I, and I think we're, we're starting to get there, but it's, you know, it's a challenge. So, so some of that challenge is upstream. It's that yes. pipeline of women that are coming in, are the, the, having yes. them go earlier and earlier into those kinds of fields um, to, to see some of those role models. What happens downstream? Are organizations prepared to bring those women in? So uh, I think that's a great point, and it brings me to the um, issue of the visibility of women in those professions, because it helps increase, uh, enhance the environment to welcome women into these technology fields. Um, we're certainly starting to produce um, women educated in these fields, um, and how do we have the right welcoming environment? Um, we have heard some about the providing the right kind of childcare or family-friendly environment, um, also teamwork environment, and the environment that you're working towards a greater goal to have an impact on things that in fact uh, affect the lives of people around the world. And I think that, that those kinds of messages really also enhance the environment that will, will draw women in. And you do need that to see that all along. And I would also just like to add one other key element that we have never paid enough attention to, and by we I mean the, the global we, uh, is lifelong learning. Um, things are, are changing so rapidly, so disruptively now, that you, you need that foundational education that you're, you're getting in, at a university, but you need to really um, be preparing yourself to learn throughout your life that your careers are changing over time and you need to be adaptable. And I, lo I love the uh, adaptability message here mm -hmm. and the sense of um, how, how are we using technology to help with that, right? So we're starting to offer um, these short courses, uh, micro masters, uh, in, for example, in artificial intelligence um, that we're offering. This is f for, uh, uh, students, lifelong learners to be taking online, well, also when in data science. You may be out there already well educated and suddenly your whole job has changed because of the data science revolution. How do you catch up with that? So we need to have our, prepare our students with the foundation when they're in the university, but be able to be prepared to be lifelong learners. 
you find that there's a gender balance or imbalance in some of those um, lifelong learning courses? So we are a little bit concerned with that, that we are finding that men are taking these lifelong learning um, MOOCs, if you will, more than women. Mm -hmm. uh, these, of course, are offered uh, internationally. Uh, people mm -hmm. around the world are signing up for these. And we are actually uh, looking into how do we attract more women to be signing up for these lifelong learning um, opportunities. Okay. So to build on that point of adaptability, if you had to ask for one thing for business to do and one thing for government to do to ensure that we use this moment for that strategic acceleration for women, what would those two things be? So at the government level, um, and actually business can participate as well, is working on how do we um, permeate math, science, and engineering into all levels of education um, faster. Uh, so this is at the, you know, from the elementary school on up. And even at the university level, there we can have uh, assistance. I, I want to say one more thing at the university level. Um, at Columbia, we're working on, um, and, and with, in particular in the School of Engineering, not only how do we um, best educate our engineering and applied science students, but also how do we provide the right um, sort of foundational courses for students who are studying other fields, right? So there's a role, a very different roles there. At the business, it's um, level, um, of course, they can be participating in supporting education efforts, but I think this providing the right environment and attracting more, more women into these uh, technology um, focused fields. And I think it's a, a message they can be using is that it's the impact of these fields on humanity, on, on the lives of people around the world are being changed because of what you're able to do with engineering and techno technological advances. Um, and of course, there's elements around the environment they can be providing within their, within their companies. Great. Thank you. Uh, Shima Murasan, what, what we're hearing is if we stay on this course, there could be some particular disruption for women in labor markets, um, but that there is a lot of opportunity. And we need to try to build towards that opportunity. So what would responsive and responsible leadership look like um, to ensure that we make that kind of change? The fourth industrial revolution has begun. But there are things we should do beforehand, and also there are things we should do a little bit later. There are two things. The first of all, in Japan, I'm sure they have been done in other countries, up until high school, we have an education that is gender free. But in university, there are different courses selected by, uh, by different gender. So women tend to go uh, study arts or other uh, home economy science or nursing. These are the areas that the women have more share than men. And for engineering, science, architecture, and those areas, those majors uh, tend to be studied by uh, men, and women only share 20% or less. I think there's a gender issue there. So w women are thinking about the uh, jobs that would be more nurtured toward women. So women think, and also the parents think, that it would be better for girls to go and study where they will be more catered for the jobs later. But with a artificial intelligence, if that changes 50% of the jobs, and then, within science and technology, it would be a different focus. It's a focus not only to enhance the ability to, uh, to uh, pursue science, but then we will have different sense sensibility, more human or art-related sensibility. So unless we do that, we lose the artificial intelligence. What we excel from than artificial intelligence is not just to pursue the science, pure science, but how do we incorporate the amenity and humanity, hospitality, 
in there? How do we integrate and enhance ability at the same time in science? And I think that also makes women shine as well. So we did have some gender differences. But I think in the new development of artificial intelligence, I think there are more areas that the women will be able to co contribute to more. I have been a minister of uh, education, uh, science, and sports. I think the more we progress towards the era of the artificial intelligence, I think the more we'll be able to see women into the uh, society. And I think our, our um, political leaders' task is how do we neuter the environment for women to come more so that we will not be beaten by the artificial, artificial intelligence? And, and how, uh, to, to turn your question back to you, how do you think that can happen? What mm. should governments be doing more? Mm. That I think is fundamental and universal in any, any place in the world. When we have this revolution, fourth evo evolution, the humankind, do we see utopia or dystopia? And 2025, and we have a new era coming. And then Carswell said 90% of the people do not need to work, so only 10% of the people work. There might be a word like that coming. So when it comes, is that utopia when we don't have, uh, well, we, if 90% of the people are not working, is it going to be a very disruptive uncertainty? Or with that going into the lack of humanity and then the society will be very disrupted? So that gives us back into the, the important uh, message. We used to have education that is more geared toward input, but now it is the output-oriented education. So what kind of society do we need to have? So it is also the perspective of the lifelong education. So how do we able to live life positively, proactively, while you enjoy your life? I think we cannot find that if you continue the same education, education system that we are doing now. So how does a political system will uh, provide that early enough? That is our task. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's take some questions from the floor. We have a few minutes to do that. I'd like to keep two minutes at the end for my final question for the two speakers. But uh, if we have a microphone, if you could just state your name and organization and then a brief question, we should be able to get a conversation going. Here, uh, my name is Stephanie Copeland. I'm the head of economic development for Colorado. Um, here, uh, keenly focused on bringing more women to the workforce with our emerging technology sector. One thing that you mentioned, um, Dean Boyce, was K through 12, and really the participation of girls, which I think is also fundamental. How do we change our teaching to engage these girls earlier when we have a system that is fundamentally oriented towards the neurosciences of boys versus the neurosciences of women? And is that something that you believe? can actually be addressed? Um, so I, I think there is an opportunity to, to really think on, on the earlier stage mathematics and maybe rethinking how we, um, how we are actually um, educating our students on that. I think computer science is a big opportunity. We're seeing more students um, in the earlier uh, ages interested in computer science. And I think there's, um, the, there's something very tangible about it, that you see, you, you, know, you program something, and you see a, a result. Uh, that can actually be um, inverted. Instead of thinking, how do I provide the mathematics to um, do computer science, instead start with something computer science, and then draw people into mathematics that way. I think there's a real opportunity there, and I don't think we've captured that at all. Um, it's a way to, to motivate students uh, to uh, learn math in a context that will have a more immediate impact. The other great opportunity is, um, which we haven't mentioned here, is the maker movement, all right? 
the sense that, uh, especially with, with tools like 3D printing, um, that we can design and create and make new things uh, is a, it's a very uh, fundamentally human activity, that we are creative human beings and we are able now to actually create rapidly, see our ideas turn into practice. What has astounded me is that what we don't capitalize in women, if we go back and uh, the area of home economics was mentioned, um, home economics actually has many making elements to it, and it's never been highlighted as the creativity of making involved in sewing, designing and sewing, or, um, or cooking. Uh, this is, this, we should be celebrating elements like that as really being a part of creativity and making. And now we're taking that to another level with the uh, idea of designing and fabricating other useful elements uh, that can change uh, so much of, of how we accomplish um, everyday things. And 3D printing is, is really helping make that uh, available to so many. Uh, we're seeing that infiltrate into, uh, into middle schools and high schools. I think the, the more we see that, uh, that's going to draw students into computer-aided design, okay? Computer-aided design is engineering, right? So there are avenues where we can take some of the things that we, we might think of, oh, you've learned A, B, C, D, E, F before you actually get to the engineering or before you get to calculus. Maybe there's things that, there's things that we could do that, um, earlier on, such as computer science, such as making and CAD, uh, that will motivate that to actually really make long-term bigger contributions. You're now gonna have to really understand what's behind these tools. What is the underlying mathematics and science? And I think that that can help shape K to 12. Okay, great. Um, we can take one very, very brief question. Hi, I am Paul Costa from AFP Agency uh, in Paris. I would like to go, about to, to go back to the figures of the impact of the technology. Can you, do you have some figures on this? And, and it's only a matter of, uh, of revenue or, or it's also an impact of destroying jobs? And I would like to know more. Yeah, sure. I mean, we can we can have a conversation on that um, okay. on that afterwards. Um, it, it's the uh, World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report, um, and it's focused very much on um, large multinational companies across nine different industry sectors. So it's primarily white collar work. I think there's a lot of other opportunity, as we've heard from the panel, in in other areas as well. Um, let me then ask the final question of our two panelists: um, If we are going to be in a world where we want um, men and women and robots to fulfill their potential, uh, then how should we be advising children today? And so uh, perhaps we can start with you, Shimamura-san. If you were to advise a 15-year-old girl today, what should she be studying? What would that be? For example, in Japan, we have memory-oriented education. That was the main core of the education system. However, for the fourth industrial revolution in the artificial intelligence age, we need something beyond that. We have iPhone right in front of you. It can get very accurate information. So the world is changing. But iPhone and artificial intelligence progress, how do we actually gain the ability that would not be beaten by those things? So what I have mentioned before, but the area of hospitality, the, it is what we call a very feminine characteristics, but how do we actually acquire that ability? And creativity, hospitality, number two creativity, it's also while you're studying, you think, how do you think? while you're studying. So it's not just to 15 years old. Uh, how do we continue to motivate curiosity throughout your life? How are we able to uh, enhance my ability and live life fully? 
And also number three is when we have computer robotics, we will have more communication ability. So while we are cooperating with others, how do you live in society? So how do you feel happiness? So while we learn the basics, I think in school and also at home, and also you, it has to be consciousness in the individual itself. How do we live creatively and happily? And I think that is important. That makes our society better, I think. Thank you. Boys, if you had to advise a 15-year-old girl today on what she should be learning in order to prepare for her future professional life, what would that be? So I, I will go back to, um, to thinking about and, and ask that 15-year-old young woman to think about um, her impact, that we have a remarkable ability to have disruptive and rapid impact on so many um, aspects of humanity today. Um, we see the big challenges in, in, in climate and sustainability, in the rapid advancements in medicine on human health, our ability to actually engage with one another locally, globally, and uh, this uh, message we've been giving here today on creativity. And when we think about that, uh, these foundational elements in math and science and engineering are all part, an integral part of preparing um, yourself to have that impact. And so, so the, how do we motivate, um, and, and this is the earlier question, how do we motivate the right kind of education, and in, in, in this case it would be at the high school level, to unlock that creative um, spirit that math and science um, enable, uh, because that's needed uh, to, to have the, the knowledge-based workforce that's going to have these big impacts, and to actually be prepared for, for a, a very changing and dynamic um, uh, work environment going forward, and ability to, to really engage in very productive and lead, leading ways. Great. Thank you very much, Dean Boyes, Shimamura-san, for sharing your views on the impact on women of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you.